I appreciate Danny leading those songs, especially the last one since I asked him to, because that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Stand up for Jesus. You know, we're living in a, a difficult time as far as religion is concerned. There's a lot of challenges out there. And it's pretty sad that even some of those that uh, at one time had at least a measure of faith, now they have very little, even less than what they used to have. And these are some of the, the more liberal uh, beliefs that's in the forefront of religion today. I saw this past week where the Methodist Church is actually dividing over the, over the issue of homosexuality. There's a lot of challenges out there, and, and we have got to be more than willing and more than able to meet the cause, and we have to stand up for Jesus. We have to stand up for his truth, for what is right, for what he teaches, and that's really what we're going to be looking at tonight. Stand up for Jesus. First of all, I want to talk about the faith for a minute. Well, I might ought to turn my machine on. Is it on? Yeah. Stand up for Jesus. The faith that we're talking about, it is the whole embodiment of what we believe. When we talk about faith, we're talking about all of the elements that God has given us as far as a structure of faith, a structure of uh, commands and, and uh, of his desire for us and what he wants us to do. That's the faith. And that faith is created from a study of God's word. Romans 10 and verse 17. Hey, I, oh, I turned it off. I'm sorry. I did. I turned it off. It's cool. It's okay. Thank you. I didn't mean to throw everything in there. Romans 10, 17. That's where I was. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, we're looking at two avenues of faith. First of all, there is that avenue where faith is our belief in Jesus Christ and the strength of that belief. The strength of that belief. The second is, of course, the faith which was once and for all given to the saints, Jude 3. That faith that we're to contend earnestly for. You know, we can know the faith. We can know what he wants us to contend for. Or else, how can we contend for it? If God hasn't revealed a structured faith, then how do we know what needs to be contended for? Well, he has, and we know after Jude 3. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. A couple things I want you to look at in that passage. First of all, that our warfare... It's not against flesh. You know, it'd be easier if it was. If we could see the enemy. Well, we know the enemy whenever it, it uh, speaks different from God's word. That's how we know. You know, we are, to, and we'll talk about defending the gospel a bit later on. We can't defend what we don't know. We can't defend for that which we have not prepared for. So we have to understand what is the gospel, what is the word, and then be prepared to defend it. And one of the ways we do that, of course, is through the knowledge of God, which is able to pull down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against God. One of the things that gets me is how... 
people, especially in the religious world, is set on their pride. You know, it's amazing. The Bible as we have it has been around for hundreds of years. The Bible as it was given through Jesus Christ has been around 2,000 years. And yet we still have people that thinks that they have found an alternate truth. Like God didn't totally reveal the truth for the first 2,000 years and now all of a sudden he's added to that faith. Well, that's not true. That's not correct. There is only one embodiment of faith, Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And we have that and we have it in its entirety. In the second book of Peter chapter 1, seeing that by his divine power, he has granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness. All things. Now that is inclusive, all inclusive. Now, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. It takes a lot of pride to stand in conflict with God's Word. I've been debating on whether to say this or not, but I think I'm going to. Years ago, I was in Abilene and what they call the preacher shootout. I, they don't have it anymore. But they would bring in some of the controversial brethren and then the, the more conservative brethren and, and they would have uh, time to speak and almost like a debate, but not quite. While there, Rural Lemons was on the floor where I was staying and I overheard him. How many of you know Rural Lemons? Rural Lemons? Editor, Gospel Advocate? Okay, well, I apologize, but anyway, he's he was uh, one of the uh, alumni of ACC and a uh, character of interest. I'll just put it to you that way. And he's a good fellow, editor of the Gospel Advocate. He had a friend by the name of Billy Graham. Evidently, him and Billy Graham had had a lot of interesting discussions. They were talking about baptism. Now this comes from Royal Lemon's mouth. It it's, didn't come second hand. He said, do you know the sad thing is he knows the truth about baptism. And when I confronted him about preaching that truth, he said, do you know how many years I've been preaching? Do you know how many people that has come to my meetings, my evangelistic efforts, and been converted, and they weren't baptized. Do you know what would happen if all of a sudden I started preaching baptism? What do you think would happen if he started preaching baptism? Nothing bad, because that's the truth. He had shadowed the truth over this man-made concept of salvation. And then had the, had the uh, pride to be able to admit it and yet willing not to do anything about it. It'll be a sad judgment day for that man and any of his killed. And there's a lot of them. Okay. I want to read Ephesians 6, verses 11 through 13. It's a passage that you're all familiar with. But I want you to notice 
a couple of words here. First word is stand. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The word stand in one form or the other is used three times in this passage and it's used more frequently than that in that's that whole context. We are to take a stand. If we don't stand, then the truth doesn't stand. If you want to know what kind of battle we're having right now in the religious world, look around you at the size of this congregation. We're in a fight. And it's a fight for the life or death of the church. Now, I don't believe it's going to die. I know it won't die. It can't die. It'll always be alive. But in order for it to stand strong, we have got to do our part in its defense. Stand fast in the faith. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1, 27. Now these are the things that we're told to stand in. In the faith. In that body of belief. The, the seven ones of Ephesians chapter 4. Stand on them. Set your anchor in the faith. Strive together. Now notice this. He says strive together. We are all to join in in this battle. We're to join in as we strive together for the faith. Standing fast in the Lord. Philippians 4 and verse 1. Stand fast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you received and which you stand by which also you're saved. To hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. The word there, the phrase hold fast, means to keep it in your memory. Keep it in your memory. You know, things are, that are important to us, especially if it's job related or whatever, we have that in our memory. We put it in our memory to keep it there because it's important that we know it. There's nothing more important than Remembering the scripture. Rhetorical question. How many of you have at some point, again, rhetorical, don't answer this, except in your heart, have practiced memorization of scripture? You know, we memorize a lot of things. I know people that can tell you about almost every football team, the statistics on every player of that football team or baseball, and yet can't quote John 3.16. And the Christians. And they will say, well, I wish I knew the Bible better than I do. Well, hello, you can. But you have to work at it. You know, I, Melissa and I attended a, a seminar a few years ago, quite a few years ago. And it was good. It was interesting. It was good. It's called Fish Hooks of the Bible, I believe. And, and what you do is you learn different hooks to know the chapter, for example, or, the, or the, what, the, what might be in that book. Uh, and you go through, we went through several books, and each chapter there was a hook in there that 
would cause you to remember, oh, okay, this chapter's talking about this, 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 this. So when you look for it, you can learn it. You can learn how to find it. And it was interesting and it was valuable. It really helped. Uh, you don't have to learn quote, scripture per se. You just have to learn where it is, where you can find it. You know, honestly, if I'm in a Bible study, I would rather someone read the scripture than quote it. Because you know you've got it in the word. And so when you're studying or talking to someone, don't quote it. Read it. Now, for your own benefit, if you want to quote it, that's fine. But as far as studying with others, read it to them so they'll know that it actually is. Stand fast in the Lord. Receive it. Hold fast to it. Put it in your memory. These are all things that uh, we're told to do in the, in, the, in the Bible. You know, it's interesting. I love the story of David and Goliath. It, it's not a child's story. I know the children like it. Because you've got a big guy with a little guy, and the little guy whips the big guy. That's always a good thing. You always want to see the bully get whooped, right? You want to see the bully get whooped? Well, the bully gets whooped. Now, I want us to look at something that David said. 1 Samuel 17, verse 47. The battle is the Lord's. You see, Israel didn't know it. Goliath didn't know it. The Philistines didn't know it. Saul didn't know it. David was fighting a dead man. He was going to win. Just a, a fledgling of a boy, sheep herder. He takes on the biggest and the best of the Philistines. And he said, the battle is the Lord's. This Philistine, he knew, was about to die at his hand. We need to have that kind of confidence in the battle we're in right now. Look at 1 Samuel 17, verse 48 now. So when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David, watch this. You ready? Hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now, let's get the picture here. Goliath comes out. He comes through the crowd of Philistines, the army of the Philistines. He pushes his way through. He stands out, stands in the forefront. He makes a challenge to the army of Israel. What do they do? The Bible says they pull back. They run backwards. They hide. They don't have the courage to stand there and face Goliath. David was incensed. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to assault the armies of God? He couldn't believe no one would take Goliath up on the challenge. His brother saying, you're a naughty child. Go home. Go be with dad. You go, go take care of the sheep. That's where you belong. Well, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't leave it alone. Saul called him in. He said, look, I can defeat the Philistine because... I killed a bear and a lion in my own hands. My bare hands. I can do it. He already knew the battle was the Lord. So Saul said, well, here, take my sword. Well, he hadn't earned any of the armor, and at least uh, that's where I take it. He didn't feel like he was worthy, or maybe it didn't fit him, or maybe a little bit of both, whatever. But he wouldn't take the, ar the uh, armor. Now the army stood, the armor stood as protection. This shows you David didn't feel like he needed protection. He said he felt that God had given him the, 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 the uh, 
all the protection he needed. So he got five rocks and a sling and went to battle and won. Why? Because God gave him the battle. Stand firm. Don't cower. Don't run backwards. Don't act confused. Don't act like you don't know what truth is if you know it. Have the courage to persevere in verse 18 of Ephesians 6. <laughs> to stay with it. You know, back when I was at Preston Road, I went to a college to use their library upon more than, more than one occasion. And that school was called Southern Methodist University. Have you ever heard of it? SMU. And, and I've mentioned this before, but there were a lot of professors that would come in the library, and I got to meet some of them, and I got to visit with some of them, and they had some wild-eyed ideas about the scriptures, about the Bible, about absolute truth. Well, now, Michael is attending SMU for their master's program. He told me a while back, he said, Dad, there's a lot of nuts up there. And he's right, but there always have been. As my friend Barney Fife would say, there's a lot of nuts out in the religious world today. And I mean that with all the love and the kindness I can come up with, but it's crazy. Some of the things that's being heralded today and considered as truth. We need to have the proper attire if we're going to go into battle. You don't go into battle and throw your gun down. You don't go into battle and take your armor off. Notice the six components. First of all, the belt of truth. Number two, breastplate of righteousness. Three, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Four, the shield of faith, which we can quench all the fiery darts of Satan. Five, the helmet of salvation. Six, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do you have in your presence, on your person, these six components? Missing none. If you are missing just one, you're vulnerable to attack and you're vulnerable to being submission, under submission to the evil one or to the untruth that's out there in the world today. You know, a good soldier knows how to win the battle. That's through training. That's through knowledge, studying, reading, and through experience. So we have got the material that God has given us. We have the training through God's Word and through our everyday experiences. And through those experiences, we should know how to stand against the evil and the, and the uh, lies that's in the religious world today, or even in the world today. Defending the truth. Acts 7 verse 51. How many of you feel as strong as Stephen? You know, it's easy to stand in this pulpit and preach. It is easy. You know why? Because you like me. I'm sure maybe there may be times you'd like to strangle me. But for the most part, you like me. 
And you agree with me on what I preach. So that makes it pretty nice. But I want to look at Stephen just for a second. Now he is with his own people, but his own people, <coughs> they're not taking it. They're not agreeing. And he's preaching about Jesus. And he was taking a stand for Jesus. And the more he preached, the matter they got, and the more he preached. He didn't mince his words. He told them exactly the way the gospel was. And that they were... Well, let me just read verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. You know, do you stand there in the face of your enemies and insult them? What Stephen do? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Now he's blaming their fathers for persecuting and putting to death some of the prophets. And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one. Of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. Who, now he's saying y'all killed Jesus. Who have received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it. The very thing they're fighting for, they don't keep. Now, he is saying this to a very unfriendly audience. Now, you know the result of that. He looks up into heaven and he sees Christ standing by the right hand of God. And then they leap upon him. They stone him. And the Bible says they gnash upon him with their teeth. Literally, they are biting him. He has made them so angry that they lose control. As a result of that sermon and his boldness to stand for Christ, he lost his life. Do we have that kind of courage? To stand in the midst of those who oppose Christianity in its purest form. Do we have the courage to confront them? Be ready to give an answer. First Peter 3 verses 14 through 15. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to any man who asks the reason of the hope that lies within you. Be ready to answer. <clears throat> in order to answer, we must know the truth. Be ready to give an answer to any man who asks the reason of the hope that lies within you. You don't have to know every doctrine out there. That's not what he's saying. You don't have to defeat every doctrine out there. All you have to know is one thing. How you're saved. That's it. Be ready to give an answer to any man who asks the reason of the hope that lies within you. Why do you have hope? That's all you have to know. War, a good warfare. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. This charge I commit unto you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest by them war, a good warfare. It's always been a battle. It's always been a fight against error. In Philippians 1 verse 17, Paul was talking about those that were preaching the gospel. He said, there were some that preached the gospel because they wanted basically the chains tightened on Paul. They didn't like Paul. Some were 
preaching out of love for Paul and because they knew that he was appointed for the defense of the gospel. Or he was set for the defense of the gospel. Now Paul said, in this case, I am set for the defense. The word defense to me is a, is a word that causes a little bit of confusion because it's our word apologetic. When we think of apologetics, we think of, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we're apologizing for something. When it comes to New Testament Christianity and the Word of God, we don't apologize for anything. And that's not what this word means. It means to defend. To defend. Now we've heard... Oh, I have all my life. In football, the, the defense wins championships. Defense wins souls. Now, there's some people that might want to apologize for the truth. Almost be sorry for the truth, for what it takes for people to become a Christian. But that's not what this word means. This word means set for the defense. Be ready to defend. Appointed to defend. And by the way, that appointment is for each of us. We've all been set for the defense. Again, we can't defend, though, what we do not know. Standing for Jesus. Just a few little tidbits of information. I think that goes along with the, the idea of standing strong, standing forth, standing out. First of all, use Scripture. Isn't that what Jesus did? In the whole book of Matthew, count how many times he referred to the Scriptures. When he was tempted by Satan, three times, three times, he answered with, of thus saith the Lord. Be ready with the Scriptures. Remember, in our armor, that is the sword of the Spirit. That's not just a defense weapon. That is also a weapon of aggression. And you know, we may need to be a little bit more aggressive in our approach to the gospel. Don't get to the point where you get so frustrated that you abandon the faith. Don't get like Elijah and think, well, well I'm the only one and I, I, I'm just, I'm tired of it. Or like Jeremiah say, I'm just not going to do it anymore. If you're like Jeremiah, at least when you say that, I hope that word is in your heart as a burning fire shut up in your bones. Like we talked about last week. Don't abandon the faith. Stay strong. Aren't you glad Paul didn't abandon the faith? I mean, look what he went through. He went through enough to have caused him to want to abandon the faith, but he never did. Next, don't believe everything you're told. I've had some real good friends and family members to tell me some things that I knew wasn't right. You know why I knew they weren't right? Because I knew the Bible. You know, the way we recognize error is we first recognize the truth and understand the truth. You know, this is something that's really bothered me. It's been weighing heavy on me for a long time. We've got elderships that's allowing error to come into their congregations. When we install elders, they should know the teaching of the Scriptures. And you got preachers that's allowing the same thing and encouraging the same things. They're in an unqualified they're unqualified to be in the position they're in. Therefore, they're allowing error to come in. And members 
are blind to what's happening. You know, they don't recognize error when they see it. Or when they hear it. The Bible says in, Ephes in uh, Genesis chapter 1 that Satan is subtle. Error is subtle. It don't just change overnight. It's, it takes a period of time. I've known people who thought Max Lucado was just next to Jesus Christ. And look at the damage he's done to the Lord's church. The error that he has embraced. And I can start naming congregations after congregations after preachers after preachers who has done the same thing. I've talked to people in some of these congregations. And they say, well, no one will confront them. Well, are you someone? If you know the truth, we've got to have the courage to confront the error. You know, in this congregation, you know why it's as solid and sound as it is? Because it's willing, and I'm not talking about just the elders and the preachers. I'm talking about the membership. It's willing to confront the error. And we can never let that die. Don't believe everything you are told. You're, you'll hear a lot of error. And some of it sounds good. Some of it, you'll be tempted to believe. But then you read in the Bible and you have a contradiction. Keep your mind renewed. Keep your mind renewed. Keep it fresh. Keep it in the Scriptures. Study the Word. Have the courage to confront. Defend the rational faith of the Bible. First Peter 4 verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The rational faith, not the irrational faith of many. Faith that really isn't faith at all. It's an irrational faith. But be ready to, to defend the rational faith. We have a battle on our hands. And that battle involves standing up for Jesus. To attack the Word of God is to attack Jesus. And when people challenge the Bible, they are challenging the authority of Jesus. And when we allow that to go on, we are condoning challenging the authority of Christ. We need to stand and be recognized as a Christian. Don't be afraid to defend the truth. Yeah, but it'll make people mad. Stephen wasn't afraid of that. Jesus wasn't afraid of that. Folks, I don't want to make anybody mad. I don't like making folks mad. But I've made a lot of people mad. You know why? Because of the truth. Now, I can't help it if somebody's going to get mad at God for the truth and take it out on me, because since they can't take it on God, they'll take it out on me. Now, I've been called some pretty nasty words because of some stands I've taken on the Bible. And I'm here to tell you that there are people 
that's not going to agree with us and our stand. And they're going to be vicious against it. And you're going to make them mad. Of course, then you got some that just has the mentality of, I don't care. I'd rather deal with the people that are mad than the people that say, I just don't care. There's all kinds of reception you get when you stand up for Jesus. But we have to be bold. Again, the outcome is not based on me, my personality. It's based on the truth, how that person responds to the truth. This evening, the lesson is yours. I'd encourage you to stand tall. To stand strong. To stand in the faith. And to stand with Christ. If you're not a Christian, then tonight would be a good opportunity for you to, to do that. To make that confession. To make that commitment. To become a child of God. Now, one of the things... When we say that we support the truth, one of the ways we support the truth is when we obey it. So if you truly believe in the authority of Christ and the teaching of the gospel and the word of God, and you've not been baptized for the remission of your sins, and you need to do that tonight, while we stand and sing together. All to Jesus I surrender, all to